Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Burali ULSA webinar. My name is Helene, and alongside me is Jade, and we're from the West Vic PHN, and we'll be facil facilitating this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways from which we are all zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience, and the ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and I wish to extend that respect to any First Nations people connecting today. We commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support self-determination for First Nations peoples and organisations and work together on closing the gap. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the majority of our webinars are recorded and freely available on our PHN YouTube channel. Um, Jade's going to have that up on the screen. You can see that there. I have our upcoming events. Uh, I don't know whether you have any upcoming events at the end of this year. Uh, please make note of the West Vic Health Pathways relating to this topic that is on the screen at the moment. And for this evening's webinar, all participants will remain on mute. If you have questions, just type them in the question and answer box, not the chat box, and I will ask them on your behalf. Uh, they will all be um, answered or asked anonymously. We do know that for some reason that software does block the question and answer function for attendees dialing in from mobile devices. So um, if you have a question but don't have access to that question and answer box, just pop it in the chat and I'll monitor that as well. Um, however, if you do that, just be mindful that it is not anonymous and everyone can see, can see those, um, those questions and comments. There is a link in the chat box to complete the survey after this evening's webinar. Um, our speakers for this evening are Professor Eugene Athan and Director, he's the Director of Public Health Unit Barwon Southwest and Associate Professor Daniel O'Brien, Director of Infectious Disease Barwon Health. Uh, I'll hand over straight over to Eugene who will commence the webinar. Thanks Eugene. Uh, good evening everyone and thanks to the PHN for organising tonight's webinar. It's a great opportunity uh, for Dan and I to speak to the general practice community and hopefully we raise awareness around the increasing problem of Beruli ulcer. The public health unit, um, as people may be aware, has uh, been a fairly new concept in Victoria. It came about as a result of the response to COVID in 2020, and we are moving towards um, a, a more distributed arrangement of public health management in Victoria. We have about 100 staff at the Bowen Southwest Public Health Unit, uh, we're moving into other communicable diseases programs, which focus on health protection, health promotion. Uh, in particular, we are also taking on notifiable infections, which includes Beruli ulcer or Ben's style ulcer, as it's been known in the past. Uh, and the, our role is to both do a notification, supervise and support diagnosis and treatment. And uh, obviously Dan and I've also been very involved in research over the last 20 years when I look back um, we also recently um, assisted with the Chief Health Officer Alert, where there was notably increased report of cases in and around Belmont and Heighton in Geelong, and also in some inner suburbs of Melbourne. And Dan will talk about some of the important aspects of uh, what we know about the disease and what we're yet to learn. So it's a great opportunity. Please ask questions and uh, we look forward to hearing from Dan. So thanks, everybody. Right, thanks Yuge. Um, <clears throat> welcome everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully that'll work. Can you see that Yuge? Yes, it's, yes, we can see it okay. Looks right. good. So look, yeah, look, thanks everybody for coming along. Um, Last time I did one of these talks was before COVID, we were in person and uh, it's obviously very different now, but um, COVID's kept us away from Beruli also for quite a while. We just didn't have time to get our heads up, but it's nice that uh, we can get back into Beruli also because it already was neglected before COVID, became very neglected and I'm hoping we may make it less neglected because it is becoming a more and more of an issue in our region. And I'm not sure we've made a lot of progress in, in how to prevent it um, as far as moving around. 
what I do think we've done is made some progress in what people can do to try and prevent it through some research we've done that we'll talk about, but also we've certainly made progress in treatment once people are diagnosed with it. Nevertheless, speaking to one of my patients today, again, just to me, it's a very significant disease. Unfortunately, it only affects a couple of electorates in Australia, so it makes it very difficult to get attention of national funding bodies. Um, and therefore we, we do lack a lot of knowledge and uh, we need more research and more money towards this. And I think more public awareness, but most importantly as well for the audience here tonight, it's about early diagnosis and treatment uh, as much as anything, because the earlier diagnosis, the easier it is to treat. So with that background, I'll get going. Um, it is now and now as Brulee ulcer, but has of course been known as Bairnsdale ulcer up until recent times, uh, as well as occasionally the Daintree ulcer up in, in far northern Queensland, was first reported in Bairnsdale in 1948 and hence the name. Um, and it causes this classic ulcer that you can see here in the slide, which is a central area of necrosis with undermining uh, and therefore a surrounding indurated area. Um, and we'll talk about a bit more of the clinical features a bit later, but there's three things that the toxin does that it produces, which is unique to this organism that are really important to understand because it, it underlines a lot of the pathogenesis, but also the treatment aspects as well. So first of all, the toxin is obviously necrotoxic and hence the ulcer. And secondly, it is immune modulatory. And so it does make it very difficult uh, on a local level for people to clear the organism without treatment. And thirdly, it's an anesthetic agent. So in fact, that gives it the classic painless um, uh, feature. Though importantly, not all ulcers are painless and we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> I got involved in this when I came to Geelong in 2000. People will be well aware of this in our region. We've had an outbreak here now for over 20 years. It's focused on these towns initially uh, that are shown in the slide. Um, and it's always been very notable that it's been very focal, so focal, local and, and coastal. So coastal towns, um, not so much in the middle of the Bowery Peninsula until recent times, not in Geelong and still not really, I don't think, in Torquay. We have the odd case from Brimley still. And around about 2010, hopped on the ferry uh, and is now very prevalent in the Mornington Peninsula. Um, so we've had a lot of experience with it now, but also We've worked with it in Africa, um, where it's again similar, but tends to be inland and around waterways and Papua New Guinea as well, where the disease really is similar. It's just more advanced in a lot of cases because of the, of the lack of access to medical care and therefore the delays in diagnosis. Many things we don't understand about Beruli ulcer. One of them is that it's basically a tropical disease. So why have we got it in southeastern Victoria? Because anyone living here at the moment will tell us it's certainly not tropical. Um, the only other place it is found is a few cases in Japan. So I don't know why it's down here in Australia, in, in Victoria, but it is. Um, it's in 33 countries otherwise worldwide. The other interesting thing is worldwide, the number of cases are actually reducing. Um, so that may be something to do with the treatment with antibiotics that's now available, but we've got the complete opposite situation in Victoria where our cases are going up um, and they're going up really quite rapidly. So 2018 was our peak year with nearly 350 cases. During the COVID years, things dropped off a bit, I'm not really sure why, but this year we're tracking again to be at least equal, if not more than 2018. <clears throat> why are the case numbers increasing? Well, Partly it's to do with the fact that the disease is moving. Um, this is a map obviously of Victoria. It doesn't show Bairnsdale, but appeared first in the east in Bairnsdale. It then moved west to, Fort, to Phillip Island where it were, occurred in the 90s. There was an outbreak there. We don't see any cases there. We haven't seen them for 20 years now. Um, it then moved across to the Ballerine Peninsula. So on, onwards westward, uh, as I said, in the early 2000s. And then in 2010 onto the Mornington Peninsula and Frankston are now move, moving up into the southeastern suburbs. And more recently, it's now in, in the surf coast in areas inlet and po probably Anglesey, certainly in Geelong, as we'll talk about in a bit, and now moving into the sort of inner northwestern suburbs of Melbourne, like Mooney Ponds, Pasco Vale, um, um, uh, uh, Essendon and those, uh, those areas. Um, 
So it's moving. Uh, it doesn't stay in the same spot. It goes up and down in some areas, but the fact that we're moving into more um, populated areas like Melbourne and, and Geelong are certainly contributing to the increase in cases, but we don't understand why it's moving around. That's one of the unknowns we need to solve. So if we look locally and we look at Geelong, well, these are the number of cases on the left and right. On the left specifically between 2012 and 2018, we had a smattering of cases in Geelong. Um, but these people all generally had uh, some sort of connection with the Ballerine Peninsula, and so it was assumed they were um, infected there. However, if you look at the last three years, we've now had a significant increase in the cases of people who live in Geelong, up to 23 cases, even more than that now. Uh, this was when the slide was made or 72% of cases in Geelong have occurred in the last three years. So something's changed. And if you look at the location of the cases now on the slide on the right, you can see that they are very focused in this area here. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so why are they moving? Why are the cases moving around? Um, well, there, there are many theories, but I think that the possums probably play a significant role in this. And the, the key role that they played was discovered by Jeanette Fife, Paul Johnson and their group uh, from Melbourne when they went down to Point Lonsdale to test the environment and, and, and had the idea of looking at possum feces and possum feces were found to actually be PCR positive for M ulcerans. And then when they collected possums, they found that a significant proportion of them actually had ulcers. And there's no doubt that the ulcers actually kill the possums in the end. Um, so possums are involved and more evidence for their involvement is very well illustrated by our own experience here in Geelong. Uh, if you look on the left, sorry, on the right slide, um, we actually, when where possums went out through Geelong and did possum fecal surveys uh, throughout the whole of Geelong, actually, in 2019, 2020, and 2022. And that's actually given us some really good insights because what we found in 2019, the reason we did it was that we had cases in Belmont and the actual positive possum feces were exactly related to uh, where we had cases. And now when we look at a couple of areas, if you look at Buckley's Falls, had some cases in 2020 uh, in, in possums. This year we, and, and last year, we're now getting cases in that exact area in Newtown. So we think Newtown's now a new endemic area. But the same pattern has been repeated in this other part of Belmont here. Uh, and now we've got cases a year or two later. Now in Heighton in, in, in 2019 and uh, 2020, we were seeing positive feces. Now in 21 and 22, we're seeing human cases and likewise in parts of Marshall. So clearly the possums and the human cases are related. What's the chicken and the egg? It's probably the possum first, but we don't know that for sure. But what we do know is where you find infected possums, you'll get infected humans. And the second thing we know is now the Geelong suburbs of Newtown, Belmont, Height and Wandana Heights and probably parts of Marshall are now endemic areas. And it's likely that these areas out further um, east will also turn, uh, will start to find cases. So I think from a GP perspective, it's really important to consider anyone in Geelong potentially exposed because we don't know where the new areas are gonna pop up. But if you look at this slide with the possum feces, they could really pop up anywhere. The second thing is we know that possums can actually infect a human because I had a patient I looked after who picked up a, a sick possum, it bit him on the finger and two to three months later, he developed a brewery ulcer. So they clearly carry it and they're infectious and their feces are infectious. The second um, part of the puzzle um, is the role of mosquitoes. Now, I don't know that that's entirely clear, but what we do know is if you look at areas of the Ballerine Peninsula where we have uh, human cases, that the incidence of human cases correlates with portion of the mosquitoes that are positive. So there is a correlation between the two that we've seen in experimental studies done at Melbourne University by Tim Stamir and his group that you can, if you coat a, a mouse's tail with M ulcerans that if you puncture it with a needle or occasionally if it's bitten by a mosquito, you can induce an ulcer. So um, certainly it's, it's possible that you can inoculate either via an injury or a bite uh, the organism um, and cause an ulcer. But I still think there's a lot that we don't know. Um, there, it's clearly a complex interaction between the environment, M. ulcerans is an environmental organism, between potentially insects uh, or injuries or, or, or soil contact and 
also clearly that there are animal reservoirs of which possum is the most, uh, is certainly well implicated. Um, how it all works, I think is still a little bit unknown, um, but we'll talk about some of the theories as we go along. What we do know is it doesn't appear to be transmitted human to human, both on epidemiological and genetic testing, our research suggests that it isn't transmissible. So we think that one in 30 households, a second person will get the infection. So I think that's always really important to tell families that they need to keep an eye out uh, on other people in the household and make sure they check their, their limbs, but that it's, it's likely they've acquired it from a common environmental source, not by a transmission between each other. With a lot of advocacy and effort, we managed to get an NH and MRC grant, thankfully, in, in 2018 to do some research. I mean, it was crazy that we have increasing cases that's spreading and we don't really know how to prevent it. So we, amongst others at Melbourne University and other centres, got some money to do some research. And what we've done here at Barwon Health with, in, in conjunction with the CSIRO is do a case control questionnaire, uh, as well as environmental samplings on a portion of those properties. I don't want to go into, into it too much, except to say that we have found some factors that are associated with BU in the case control questionnaire. One is diabetes. Now, it's not surprising because other mycobacterial infections are more common in diabetics, such as tuberculosis and leprosy. So it just means that those who are diabetic, they probably need to know that they're at a higher risk and, and probably need to take more precautions, but also uh, keep an eye on their skin and present quickly if they have any lesions. Um, second of all, I think that's really, you know, there's occupational exposure. There's no doubt we see lots of tradies, gardeners, um, landscapers, um, golf care workers who develop this disease. And, and our study showed that working outdoors with soil contact puts you at higher risk. And that's just, I think, being in contact with contaminated soil that is contaminated by possum feces, basically. Um, environmental thing, once again, possums were strongly associated, but not only possums themselves, but the more possums you have, the more likely your risk is. So clearly possums again, but also some other environmental things like the type of trees you have, tea trees, high risk, the use of bore water appeared to be high risk and having a pond at your property was high risk. Um, but what I really think was really useful is that we did find some protective behaviours. And there were three things that seemed to really protect you. One was, if you get a wound while you're outside, if you immediately tend to your wound with uh, washing it and then putting antiseptic, you reduce your risk of foie ulcer. Likewise, insect repellent use reduces your risk and also covering with your arms and legs with clothing reduces your risk. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a sec. BCG came out as a protective factor. So there will be many in this audience who've had BCG, so that might be helping you. Um, and we need to explore that a bit further. <clears throat> but what I think was even further interesting, if you look at pro pro potential protective behaviours and you put them together, the more of these potential protective behaviours, I'm not going to run through them, but they're on the right here, that you do, the less likely you are to develop Peruli ulcer. And if you look at the three that we said before actually being strong, have been associated with prevention, that they're actually additive. The more that you do, the less likely you are. So I think we can say to people now, if you want to protect yourself from Peruli ulcer, so a family of someone who's got a case, so they're at high risk, as I said, one in 30 households will get another case that when you go outside, you cover up any wounds with dressings. And if you receive any wounds while you're there, you, you wash them in soap and water, you use antiseptic. You cover up as much as possible. That's long sleeves, long, long pants, uh, socks and, and, and shoes when you're gardening, especially. And that those areas are not covered, use the insect repellent. And I think we've got some evidence to say that that can help prevent disease. And I think that's really important because up until recently, we haven't really had a lot of tools to help this, us in that area. From the environmental surveys, um, what we, we, we did a lot of work on this and I won't go through it all, but I just thought that it's, it's important just to emphasize again that the soil's positive. And I, I suspect that's because of possum feces a problem. Feces from possums were strongly positive again, but also we could show they're actually viable. That means they're alive and they are therefore potentially infectious. But the other tantalizing thing is we found feces from foxes that was also in a proportion of them um, 
positive, but also viable. So it's possible that uh, in fact, foxes have a role in disseminating this disease and might be a reservoir as well. So we need to look into that. But anyway, in summary, I think there are a number of transmission pathways. It's direct inoculation, either through a bite, through a skin injury or a pre-existing wound. So it's not just one way. You'll often hear people say it's just mosquitoes. I don't believe that. I think it's, there's, it's, it's multiple potential ways. Um, there are in certain environmental risks we've been through that there are some things that you can do to try and prevention, prevent it, that there are certain populations that we should be educating about their risk and how to prevent it. And, and that the tantalizing thing is whether BCG could provide some protection on a population level. So I want to move now on, on to clinical aspects and then on to treatment. Um, so here's the ulcers again. Classic appearance here for necrosis in the middle, the induration around the side and the undermining. But what I just wanted to mention is in 5% of cases, the ulcers will be multiple. Now, these are two ulcers here and they're close together, but they can be on many separate parts of the body. Um, second thing is that 15% of cases are not ulcers. So it's slightly misnamed really, because it's not always an ulcer. And this is where sometimes people run into traps. So it can be nodular, which is probably a pre-ulcerative condition if you leave it low enough, but somewhere between five and 10% of our cases are nodules. So um, we'll talk about diagnosis, but um, a PCR swab of that will be negative because it hasn't ulcerated yet. Plaques are found in Africa. We don't tend to see them, but they're subcutaneous swellings that you can see in this photo. But the really important one that uh, really causes us trouble is the edematous or the cellulitic lesions. Um, now, again, I haven't got time to go through it all today, but importantly, these are pain, painful. So not painless, but painful. They have signs of inflammation, just like cellulitis. So they will get fever, they'll get high inflammatory markers, and they'll often, surprisingly, I don't know why, looked like they might respond initially to your anti-staphylococcal antibiotics like Fluclox or Keflex, um, but they're not, uh, they're brutally ulcers. And the key is that it's cellulitis, especially around the joints. So your elbows, your knees, your ankles, your wrists. Um, in someone from an endemic area, that's a little bit odd. You don't have a portal of entry or there's no reason why they should have cellulitis. You, should, you really need to think about edematous lesions because these things are highly, um, uh, destructive, they're rapidly progressive. And, you know, in a week to two weeks, you can really lose a large amount of tissue. So they're the ones that, that really cause us the most problem. I have, we have published a paper on this, if you're interested, more interested in the clinical uh, features um, that you can look into. WHO classifies lesions according to their size and whether or not you've got multiple lesions or lesions at a critical site. But basically, most of our lesions are category one, less than five centimetre in diameter, and we would term these as mild. However, severe lesions, that's category two or three, are not just in Africa. We, we have them as well. And, um, and these are a couple of examples. Here's a lady uh, with really severe ulcer of her ankle um, with a large tissue destruction. And another person um, on the right who had 13 ulcers at presentation. Um, what we don't see is the osteomyelitis. It is very common in Africa, about 15% of cases, but we don't see it here. I've seen it twice in about 1,200 cases that I've looked after. So I think it can happen, but it is rare. So people often get really worried about the bones underneath. In my experience, that's a very unusual uh, occurrence and would be in someone who's had the ulcer for a very long time that hasn't been diagnosed or treated. This is a slide just to show you that we do have severe disease. 20 to 30% of our cases are severe. This is the, is, is the blue uh, part of the graph, graph here. And it's possible that in fact, we're seeing more severe cases. My impression is over the years, in fact, the proportion is increasing, um, but the reasons for that are not clear. Where do you find lesions? Well, it's classically on the limb. So lower limb, two thirds, upper limb, one third. Very uncommon on the trunk less common on the face and on the scalp. The only one I've ever seen, I thought it's probably very unusual, turned out to be a skin cancer that had been infected with brutal ulcer. So anything on the actual hair growing part uh, of the scalp, be very wary of another diagnosis. But the other feature is it's often over a joint. So lesions, funny lesions over a joint, think of them ulcerans. I mentioned earlier that early diagnosis is the key because it makes a massive difference to treatment. So you want to get them when they're nice and small, like in, you can see in these photos. Um, 
Why? Well, you get more rapid healing times, and I'll explain a bit about that in a bit. Reduced need for surgery, reduced duration of antibiotics, which is really important because these are not easy antibiotics to take. And look, in Africa, it's poor ignition, not so much here about the reduced long-term deformity and disability effects. So how do you diagnose it? Well, I think people, most people here would be aware that it, basically it's diagnosed on a PCR, which it, for an ulcerative lesion involves swabbing the undermined edges of the lesion and sending that fresh, making sure you can see on the tip of the swab that you've got some material there. Because if the lesion's not ulcerative, or if you've got no material, well, you might get a false negative PCR result. So it's really important, 5% of cases that we see have a false negative PCR. So if you're suspicious, especially if it's not ulcerated, then go ahead and either repeat the swab or better off, do a punch biopsy because a punch biopsy is a very sensitive, send it for both PCR, but also histopathology, but don't be put off by an initial negative PCR because that's certainly uh, one in 20 cases. That's what we see. Moving on to treatment now, um, I just wanted to talk about the evolution of treatment because it has really evolved a lot, uh, but focus on the two main things and that's the use of antibiotics and the role of surgery. Um, this is a long time ago now and I'm sure people are aware, but historically it was basically thought to be a surgical disease that you treat with surgical wide excision. But for a number of reasons, uh, it's clearly not. Um, this is an example. This is when I started in Geelong early on. This was for somebody who had a lesion on the ankle, had a free vascularized flap with a skin graft. Uh, and you can see how destructive that was with huge morbidity and huge cost. And despite that, 25% of our cases would recur. Um, and in some areas, it actually wasn't possible so to actually excise uh, the lesion. So in fact, it was really problematic. But it never made any sense to us. I mean, why wouldn't antibiotics work? Because in vitro they worked and they worked very well. And all other mycobacterial diseases are very sensitive to antibiotics. So bottom line is we was we we wanted to, but we were also forced to start using antibiotics, you know, in the early 2000s and became clear very quickly that not only the antibiotics you could see visually reduced the amount of induration uh, that you could see, but also you prevented disease recurrence. So um, we were combining initially with with surgery, but this is just early experience, and it just just I just wanted to show you that when we used antibiotics, we had 100% cure rates in our first um, 90 patients, whereas when we used surgery alone, we had a 28% failure rate. So bottom line is, antibiotics worked, and this has been shown very well both here in Australia by our teams, but also in Africa, and the cure rates are at least 99% in most cases, so highly effective. But not only that, you actually don't need surgery to cure lesions. So we started using antibiotics alone about 2011. Um, and here's a, a, a lesion on, on a wrist at baseline. And five months later, you can see it's completely gone with minimal scarring. We published our experience in you know, 2014, 2015 on the first 132 patients, which we didn't use surgery with, just antibiotics. And we had a 99% cure rate which led to guidelines being presented in that. These are still available in the MJA. We haven't updated them. We do need to do that. COVID's got in the way, but uh, that will hopefully happen maybe next year. But anyway, the bottom line is there are some surgical principles which underlie treatment. And that is, first of all, it is a medically treated condition now. Um, and we use antibiotics for um, a, a, a recommended period of eight weeks. It needs, like any other mycobacteria, to be a combination of antibiotics with rifampicin as the key one, plus a second antibiotic, which can either be a fluoroquinolone or clarithromycin. And that surgery is no longer re required for the cure of infection. Instead, it's aimed at wound management and prevention of deformity or disability. And I'll run through the roles that it has in a bit, but what is clear to me is surgery absolutely has a role in many infections uh, for a number of reasons. So it's not that we don't use it, but it, most of our, or the majority of our cases don't need it. Um, if you are gonna operate, we prefer to get at least some antibiotics in, in before we do so, because that just shrinks the wound and stabilizes the tissue and means the surgery doesn't have to be as extensive. Um, 
if we just focus quickly on antibiotics alone, I think it's really important to understand the natural history of what happens to an ulcer when you give antibiotic treatment, because this, I think, is what led to people thinking that um, antibiotics don't work. It's just that they didn't understand what happens when you treat with antibiotics. And we've tried to document, well, we have published on this and documented it basically so that people are clear. But he, this will just underline, I think, hopefully in your minds exactly what happens so that you're not thinking you're failing treatment when in fact you're actually winning. So first thing is that when you start antibiotics in the first few weeks, you do see a reduction in the amount of induration, which is the purple, um, around the lesion. So it looks a little bit better, uh, less red, less angry, but the ulcer is clearly still there. Um, but the second thing is that um, with time, two things will happen. One is your induration will start increasing. And the second thing is that your size of your ulcer will start increasing. So more than 70% of an increase in size of their ulceration, and that's doubling on size on average, okay? And you can see this with the blue, the induration goes up again, and you can see in purple, the size of the ulcer goes up. So that's completely expected. That's what you I, I tell people before I start treatment, this is what's gonna happen, so they're not surprised. Why does it happen? Well, what's actually happening is when you're giving them antibiotic treatment, you're reversing that immune inhibitory state and you're allowing the immune system to now become active and therefore you get inflammation and inflammation, of course, is swelling. Um, second thing is it's pain. Um, and as you kill off the bug, the mycobacteria, mycolactin level goes down. So there's less anesthetic, but also there's more inflammation. So you get a more painful lesion. So short-term pain, long-term gain, I guess is a thing, but a painful lesion is a sign that antibiotics actually working. The next really important thing to understand is that the lesion doesn't heal while it's still inflamed. You've got to wait. You can see here, we're now 10 weeks into treatment, a lot of inflammation still, large area of ulceration. But once the inflammation settles down, so you get down here at 14 weeks, they're about the same, then it heals. So by 18 weeks, it heals. And we've shown quite clearly that the amount of induration is directly proportional to the time to heal. So the key is we've got to work on reducing that inflammation. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a bit. This is, the other thing that you'll see us talk about is basically paradoxical reactions. And this was the recognition that what we're actually doing is when we treat people with antibiotics, we are, as I said, reversing the immune inhibitory state. And sometimes, probably 20 to 30%, you get a significant worsening in the clinical appearance. <clears throat> you can see this histologically in, in, in side A and B here, that when you start, before you start treatment, the actual lesion uh, is very um, uh, necrotic. These are necrotic fat cells here with almost no inflammation. And then when you stain it, you've got large numbers of pink acid fast bacilli. But once you start antibiotics, sides C and D are about six weeks into treatment. You can see a huge amount of inflammation there. And when you stain for organisms, you don't see any. Because what you're really doing is reversing that in immune inhibitory state and you're allowing the immune response. Now, a paradox reaction is when that immune response is really clinically significant. So it's causing significant ulceration and uh, significant deterioration. But the paradox is it looks like it's getting worse, but that's because it's actually getting better. <clears throat> and I think that's what led to people thinking antibiotics don't work is that they were noticing this and thinking they, they were failing. But once we recognize this, we now understand that it's, it's, it's part of successful treatment. And now the the challenge is to manage it. So once again, just to outline it in this sort of natural history, looking at the amount of induration. So in the first few weeks, it goes down and then it builds back up again, but now it builds up even more than the original induration and the size of the ulceration increases significantly. So the point is that a, a significant paradoxical reaction can really cause a significant amount of tissue loss. So they can be really quite destructive and therefore they can be problematic. How often do they happen? About 20 to 30%, the actual clinically significant paradoxical reactions. But a really important point is they don't have to be in the wound because what a paradoxical reaction can do is unearth other subclinical infections that were there already, we just didn't know about. So sometimes they pop up in, in an area close to the lesion 20% of the time, but sometimes they can pop up in a completely separate part of the body. And so again, 
you know, people think if a second lesion occurs, that means the antibiotic's not working. No, in most cases, that's simply that you, you've had something there, it would have come out in time, but your antibiotics and the paradox correction bring it, bring it out. So that's really important to understand. The median time is about six weeks into treatment, but can occur, you know, two weeks in even, or even occur in 25 or 20% of cases after antibiotics are finished. So once again, you can be three or four months after antibiotics and pop up a lesion or the lesion get worse again. It doesn't mean that you actually failed treatment. It might be that it's a delayed paradoxical reaction. And why is that? Because it takes a long time in many lesions for all the dead mycobacteria and necrotic toxins and everything to be removed by the body. So the stimulus there for the reaction can, can persist for a long time. I think this slide's really important when you're dealing with patients. It, it tells us two really important things. One is it's looking at the days to healing according to the size of the lesion. And the first thing is, is clearly the bigger the lesion, the longer it takes to heal. But the second thing is that with antibiotic treatment, it's a long time to heal wounds. So if your lesion's less than two centimetres, the median time is three months. If it's two to five centimetres, it's four months. If it's more than five centimetres, it's six months. And so right at the start, when you start antibiotic treatment, you, you, it's really important to let your patients know that in fact, this lesion is gonna be there for a long time and they're gonna need patience. And then when they finish their antibiotics, cause that only goes for eight weeks, they're still gonna have an ulcer. <clears throat> but the second thing is that if you get significant paradoxical reaction or significant inflammation, that your wound healing time will increase by six to eight weeks. Um, and therefore, the paradoxical reactions, not only are they destructive, but they will hold back your wound healing time. And therefore, doing something about it is, is, is often important. The hardest thing to work out is, is it a paradoxical reaction or is it relapse? Um, clinically, they do look a bit different on these slides. I don't know if people can appreciate it. The one on the right is a relapse. The one on the left is paradoxical reaction. Paradoxical reactions are often, you know, the tissue looks healthy. It's just quite inflamed. Um, whereas on the right, it's really unhealthy looking tissue um, that really looks like you know, an original lesion that hasn't been treated. But the key to it really is, if you're not sure clinically, is to biopsy it. Because on biopsy, what you'll see is a large amount of inflammation. You'll see minimal or no organisms. And, and, and that gives you the answer. It's really important. People often send it off for a PCR. The PCR comes up positive and people feel therefore they've failed treatment. The PCR is positive, of course, because that's why you've got a paradoxical reaction. So the PCR is not useful at all in distinguishing between the two, because in by far the majority of cases, the PCR will be positive in paradoxical reactions. So that's really important to understand. Um, cultures are useful, but they take you know six to twelve weeks to come back. So <clears throat> they're not they're only useful in retrospect. Now. The problem we've got with antibiotics is rifampicin and clarithromycin or rifampicin and ciprofloxacin are not that well tolerated. They are really difficult antibiotics to take, especially as you get older. So in our experience, one in five people who start antibiotics will have, to, will have an antibiotic reaction severe enough that they have to stop at least one antibiotic. And if you're greater than 65 years of age, that's actually 40% of people. <clears throat> and of those people, 15% actually end up in, of the ones who have reactions, end up in hospital, it's so severe. So. They are difficult antibiotics to take <clears throat> and that causes a lot of challenges. But the second important thing to understand is that it can occur throughout the antibiotic course. Just because you got through two weeks doesn't mean it can't happen. In fact, the median time is about 28 days. The helpful thing is what it does mean is if we can reduce the duration of antibiotics in some people, then you can significantly reduce the risk of antibiotic complications. And so we'll talk about that when we talk about the role of surgery. So where does surgery come in? As I said, I think surgery has a, you know, a really important role still in the management of this condition. And that's because with the antibiotics, we've got significant rates of complications, as I've mentioned. There's very long healing time. So people often get frustrated or it's expensive or you know, lots of visits to the doctors. Uh, that there are paradoxical reactions, which as I said, delay wound healing and cause, can cause significant tissue loss. And there are a number of people who are got so many medications that interact with these antibiotics that you really, it's really difficult to treat them. Um, or you have people who don't want antibiotics. So um, there is a role for antibiotics in all of these cases. And we have tried to publish our experience and recommendations on this in the ANZ Journal of Australian New Zealand Journal of Surgery in 2018. 
that sort of has a table in a nutshell that goes through the different forms of surgical treatment that can be used, what the indications are for them, what size of lesion is suitable for them, the advantages and disadvantages, and also the timing. And I'm not going to go through in fine detail, but just to give you a bit of a, a, a feel for it, um, I'll run through some of the options. So first of all, curative surgery, there is still an option for those who can't take antibiotics or those who do, do not want to take antibiotics, but it needs to be a, a small lesion in an area that's accessible to a wide excision and direct closure. So if you've got to do a vascularized skin flap or skin graft, I don't think it's on because that's too much morbidity. Uh, but if you can do it here, as you can see this one on the foot, a reasonably small wound and it heals uh, much more quickly. So in two to three weeks. The important thing is you've got to check the histological margins. If there's any information to the margins, there's a very high risk that this will recur. Here's another example of a lesion on the back of the arm. It's often a good place to do it because there's a lot of tissue, they can get the wound back together. But have a look, it is quite a significant wound and it uh, generally requires a general anaesthetic. So there's some disadvantages in that. Furthermore, as I said, if they, if they don't get it all out, it'll come back. But also the people who are at high risk of recurrence and those there are people who are immune suppressed or potentially those who are more elderly. So an example would be, this was a lady who was 78 on prednisolone for PMR, had an attempt at a wide surgical excision and direct closure and she recurred. So it's not suitable for everyone, but it can be suitable for a proportion of people. The second thing is that surgery can actually reduce the time that you need to take antibiotics for. And we've seen this in two ways. One, when we looked at those people who had surgery after they'd had antibiotics and then um, had that tissue cultured, we saw that anyone who'd had between four and eight weeks of antibiotics, none of them were culture positive. So most people actually sterilize their lesion early in their antibiotic course. Um, and the second thing is that when we looked at people who had to stop their antibiotics either through toxicity or um, they wanted to, that if they'd managed to get between two and four weeks of antibiotic treatment and they had surgery as well, there was a 98% cure rate. So bottom line is that if you can get 21 to 28 days of antibiotics combined with surgery, you're very, very likely to be able to cure your people, patients. And so often people who have severe antibiotic side effects who haven't had, uh, who've, had, who've managed to get at least three weeks of antibiotics, I'll just try and get some surgery done on it and we'll explain in a minute what, and that will generally result in cure. The only one who failed had only had seven days of antibiotics. <clears throat> so antibiotics can be used to reduce duration of antibiotics. And now that may be because you have toxicity, but it might just be that the person doesn't want to take antibiotics, but also that you reduce the risk of toxicity because remember half of the antibiotic complications happen after four weeks of treatment. So here's a lesion on the uh, under aspect of the arm, amenable to surgery with uh, an excision and closure, but this time it's a conservative excision. So it's not wide through normal tissue. It's just taking out the macroscopically abnormal tissue and that uh, person achieved cure. So that's something we can either use for patient choice or if someone who's had a reaction. But another thing is just actually a curette under a local anesthetic. So here's a small lesion. So these are for small lesions. There's a small lesion on the back of the calf, has a curette uh, under local anesthetic, just taking out the macroscopically abnormal tissue. Four weeks, it's already starting to heal. Eight weeks, it's, it's totally healed. And so again, only four weeks of antibiotics needed in a curette um, and it reduces the duration of antibiotics, but also probably helps the time to wound healing um, because you're taking out the necrotic material, which is causing inflammation, which is holding the wound back. A reasonably well-known local had that performed uh, and had good success. Um, antibiotics plus debridement is something that is often very useful too, because one of the problems is when you're treating these wounds, if they don't clean up, so here's an example again, 10 weeks in, still a lot of uh, inflammation, not much wound healing, because when you look at the lesion, it's still necrotic and inflamed, and that inflammation is going to hold back wound healing. But if you were to just simply debride that and clean it up and get rid of all that necrotic and inflammatory tissue, what happens? Four weeks post debridement, beautifully clean ulcer, heal six weeks post debridement. That's really quick if, if you hadn't done surgery. So it's a way of actually reducing um, your time to healing. So 
in this situation, we're not using it to reduce antibiotic deterioration, we're, we're using it to improve your wound healing rates. Importantly though, you can actually debride wounds really well in the clinics. <clears throat> and I find if people use a good debriding agent and flamenol port's the one that I think works really well, plus debridement in the clinic uh, with the clinic nursing staff, um, that uh, you can have really good outcomes. You don't need formal plastic surgery in most situations. So here's a lesion, baseline greater than five centimeters. As I said earlier, that median time to heal this lesion is six months. Day nine, still very necrotic, not looking good. Week three, after treatment purely in a, in a GP surgery with um, debriding agents and some, uh, some debriding uh, by the nurse, looking much cleaner at week three, week five looking great, by week 13 totally healed. So as I said, normally six months, this healed in three months, and I'm sure it's because of the, the, the really uh, good care received at the GP surgery, but also the debriding agents. And therefore, point being, I think still there's a real role for um, regular dressings in GP clinics. I think it can really help. Um, but also that doesn't always have to be a formal surgical debridement. Just to say, we do still sometimes use skin grafts, but really only on very large lesions. This is a cellular lesion of the arm with significant tissue destruction. The, 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 um, the lesion itself will take probably a long time to heal but also very painful and sometimes covering the wound with a skin graft will not only heal the wound quicker, but will also relieve pain quicker. So that, that is still occasionally used. Here's an example where antibiotics have been given for eight weeks, but the wound's really not progressing. 13 weeks in, you can see still quite necrotic and a significant wound. Now you could debride that to improve wound healing, or if you wanna just get it healed straight away, you can excise it with a conservative excision. But once again, notice the size of the scar. It is really quite big and you've had a general anesthetic. So there are some downsides to that, but that is an option. The main take home message though, is that there is no longer a role for aggressive excisional surgery of emulsorans lesions. We haven't been involved in a vascularized tissue flap, I don't think since about 2004. It shouldn't happen anymore. Sometimes spit skin graft, but rarely but mostly antibiotic treatment combined with some surgery to help wound healing uh, should avoid the need for, for this sort of situation, uh, almost always. The last thing I wanna quickly talk about is the paradoxical reactions. As I mentioned, they can be quite significant. Here's an example. When you look at a cellulitic lesion like this, um, you just know it's gonna necrose and ulcerate because that's what they do. Um, you can see here after three weeks, you're already getting this necrosis. This is on antibiotic treatment. At six weeks, not looking good, and look at seven weeks. Um, so not only is there significant tissue destruction, um, but this is a long way off healing and, um, and that uh, the patient, of course, thinks you've got no idea what you're doing. The really important thing, again, is this is not a failure of antibiotic treatment. This is an expected outcome of antibiotic treatment. It's just we need to manage it and try and uh, prevent as much tissue loss as we can, but also get it healed as quick as we can. So one thing you can do is corticosteroids. So we use corticosteroids quite a lot, um, a dose of about 0.5 milligram per kilogram. And you can see here, here's a lesion getting very inflamed. You start the corticosteroids, the inflammation reduces significantly. It does take a while to settle, but it eventually will lead to healing with, but with importantly, not significant tissue loss. Problem with steroids is of course they have side effects um, <clears throat> and that's a downside, but they can be very effective in preventing significant tissue loss. The other thing though that can help is surgery because here's another case, significant inflammation, paradoxical reaction. What's that? Nearly five months into treatment, still inflamed, still not healing. Can debride that, clean it up. Two weeks post-surgery looks great. Six weeks post-surgery it's healed. So paradoxical reactions can definitely help to heal wounds and also preserve tissues. So what we'd say in mild to moderate paradoxical reactions, we would generally observe most importantly, don't change or stop antibiotics because it's not antibiotic failure. But if it's severe, some corticosteroids, uh, which we try and wean over about eight weeks, plus or minus surgical debridement. So that's where I'd like to stop today. Just to mention that it is obviously really important local condition, but it's really important throughout the whole um, PHN network because of course, the Ballerine Peninsula and the Mornington Peninsula is our tourist areas. People come down here, many people have holiday homes who live in, in Western Victoria. 
um, who will come here for a few weeks, pick up their disease, the incubation period, I didn't mention I should have, is on average about four to six months. And they'll present to GP practices outside the region. And so uh, it's really important, I think, for everyone to be aware of this condition, because as I said, di early diagnosis is the key to, uh, to treatment. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, Dan. I do have some questions. First one, if prior mycobacterial infection, whether naturally acquired or vaccine induced, provides some level of protection against subsequent disease due to TB and viruli, why high levels in Africa and Papua New Guinea? Of the disease? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And it brings me to two points. One, I'd say it's also really, we've shown that you do get some protection from having natural disease. So when you get rid of the uh, the organism, I always say to people, it's like you've been immunised. So you are more protected than someone who hasn't had it, but it's not bulletproof. So in our experience, there's a recurrence rate. Or, or, so that's another infection of about 1%. Okay, so 99% of people who I see, I never see again, but 1% of people can catch it again. So I think like any vaccine it has a failure rate. And so it does induce immunity, it's not foolproof. And what probably happens in Africa and other places is that one, you know, you're vaccinated against TB and not specifically virulia also, but two is that um, vaccines are not 100% effective. And so if you get ongoing exposure, then there's an ongoing risk of disease. Thank you. Next question, the best dressing while the healing process goes on. Yeah, look, I think, you know, it's always a little bit different, but I think that the best dressings are the sort of cotton-based gauze dressing. So Primapore is an example because waterproof dressings smother the wounds too much. Um, Band-Aids, no good at all. They, they don't absorb enough. What you want is something that absorbs the fluid that's coming out, but also allows it to breathe. So I, I find the cotton-based sort of gauze dressings really good change them every day in the early stages. If there's a lot of wound, because when, when you get these sort of six to eight weeks in and you're starting to get the immune response, as I said, you get increasing pain, you get increasing ulceration often, but you also get increasing fluid discharge often. So wounds can come sometimes become quite, um, have quite a amount of fluid discharge and therefore sometimes you even need to change the wounds that your dressing is twice a day. But I just say, look, if your dressing is getting soaked through, change it. If it's dry, you might need to only change it every couple of days. Uh, another question. Does buriloi ulcer slash disease confer protection against further lesions slash disease? Yeah, that's what I just said before. So um, uh, it, I think it does, but it's not foolproof. So I always just say to people, that don't live your life paranoid, you're gonna get another one because it is really uncommon. But if you see something, don't delay in getting it checked out. Don't think you can't get another one. And I just run over those three things that can prevent disease. That is covering up when you're out, outside wearing mosquito repellent on exposed areas. And if you've got wounds, cover them up. Or if you receive wounds while you're out there, make sure you wash them in soap and water and apply some antiseptic. Uh, next question, has topical steroid, for example, Eliofret, been used with Gladrap? My dermatologist recommended this for me years ago for my reactions to mosquito bites, and it works very well. Yeah, look, that's another good question. Well, I've never used it as a treatment of the ulcer. Sometimes it's, I've used it as a local treatment for a paradoxical reaction. So in someone who you don't want to give them oral steroids for some reasons, then Topical steroid, not on the ulcer, but in the on the surrounding induration area, is something that can be tried. Yes, but I must admit I don't use it a lot. I haven't gotten we haven't got nearly as much experience with that. Okay, I don't actually have any more questions that have come in. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you, Dan and Eugene, for taking the time. I know how busy you are, especially this time of year and what everything that's going on in Bowen Health. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak to our, um, our members. And um, please don't forget to fill out your evaluations. Uh, if you have any further questions or anything, you can email me and I can pass them on to um, Eugene and Dan for you. Um, so thanks again. Any closing comments from either of you? I'll maybe uh, leave that to just you. To let, 
let the GPs know. Um, Dan is a recognised international expert in this area. So a lot of the um, advice that is given is really cutting edge and where, where the state of play is around this disease. So uh, just keep that in mind. So thanks, Dan. It's been a wonderful review of a very complicated disease. Thanks, Yuge. And thanks everyone for attending. And uh, yeah, feel free to give us a call if you've got any questions or cases you want to discuss. Thanks everyone. Bye for now. Thanks all. Good evening. Bye.